All right. Would you uh, get your Bibles or your smart devices out and uh, let's turn to Luke, the 17th chapter. And as you turn there, I just want to share with you, um, I was able to preach and privileged to preach the um, community Thanksgiving service this past week at the Presbyterian Church. It's a little more liturgical than I'm used to. What do you mean? A lot of pomp and circumstance when the organ started playing and all the ministers walked down the middle aisle and it was interesting. <laughs> Michaela was in the community choir. She was sitting behind me. So they had lots of scripture readings and different hymns and I uh, you know, hymns, they had to get the hymn book out, and I was buried in this, and how can you worship when you're buried here and you're trying to concentrate and raise your... It was just awkward. I like to sing off the wall. It's uh, <laughs> where the words are on the screens. But uh, it came time for me to, to preach, and uh, I got up and I told the choir behind me, I said, now if you're going to be behind me, you have to support me, so I'm going to deputize you. And I deputized the choir, and they had this responsibility. If anybody fell asleep, they threw a spitwad at them. <laughs> so, of course, everybody laughed, and we had a good time. But I, I started the message with an icebreaker to get me loosened up and more comfortable and get the congregation. Uh, and so if you've heard this one before, laugh anyway, okay? It'll help me. <laughs> but there, were, there was a similar, uh, similar uh, Thanksgiving community service, and they were receiving an offering for the community pantry. And all the proceeds were going to help support people for Thanksgiving that couldn't afford Thanksgiving meals. And so the pastor got up to receive that offering and he said, if there's anyone here that would like to start the offering out with, with a thousand dollar gift, we'll let you pick the hymns today. And an older a widow lady in the back came running up to the front and said, I'll do it, I'll do it. She lays her thousand dollars down on the altar and she said, I pick him in the green shirt and him in the red shirt and him... <laughs> H-I-M, not H-Y-M-N-S. And then, th I didn't share this one, but and you all get a bonus today. Bill and Tom were talking about uh, their hunting experiences, and Tom was telling Bill that when he went hunting, his wife wanted to go, for, so for the first time ever, he had taken his wife hunting, and he was telling Bill, he said, there is no way I'm ever taking her again. She complained about how cold it was. She rustled around and made a bunch of noise scaring the animals off. She put the wrong gauge shot in the gun. Uh, it just was awful. And to beat it all, she got a bigger turkey than I did. <laughs> so now that we're all joyously laughing and ready to hear the word, uh, before we get to Luke 22, I want you to look at Psalm 95 too. It's on the screen. You don't have to turn there. Come before Him with thankful hearts. We're in the season of Thanksgiving, and um, I preached Thursday on turning your Thanksgiving into Thanksgiving. It's more about a living way than it is a holiday. And we need to be thank living out of thankful hearts. And so this morning, sharing some of this, the same points, but it's going in a different direction for our congregation here this morning in the body of Christ. But we come before Him, not just on Sunday mornings with thankful hearts, but every time we... Uh, are spending quiet time or special time with Him. We're always coming before Him with thankful hearts. And then in Hebrews, the 12th chapter, verse 28 from the uh, Lavender's New Testament says, Therefore receiving an unshakable kingdom. How many of you know that you're in an unmovable, unshakable, unending kingdom? And the kingdom is living on the inside of you. We're not waiting for it. We're not going to it. It's here now and it's on the inside of you. How do I know that? What is the kingdom? The kingdom is the king's domain. So where's the king living? He's living on the... He has taken residence up on the inside of us, so we are the kingdom. We manifest the kingdom when we operate and move in the kingdom. And that unshakable kingdom we have received, now may we have grace by which we serve God acceptably. Now we're not serving God to be accepted, but because of the grace of God we are accepted. And when we've received the King on the inside and His grace, we're accepted in the Beloved, and now we serve Him out of that grace. And serving Him out of that grace, the Living Bible adds, with a thankful heart, in reverence and in awe. Not in fear, not in an, oh my goodness, I'm scared to death. But then that's the God that, unfortunately, that we've been taught and that we portray to the world is this... Uh, monster somewhere that will just make you a grease spot on life's highway uh, and that's not our God at all 
Amen. So would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for the opportunity to share your word. May everything that we say encourage and build up the body of Christ this morning. And may we leave here uh, realizing that we can apply scripture to our lives to live with a thankful heart. In Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, looking at our text this morning, Luke the 17th chapter, I'm going to read from the Lavender's New Testament. It will be on the screen so that you can follow along with the same translation. The Lavender's New Testament is brand new. It came out in 2015. This is the most authentic uh, translation that I've ever seen from the Greek to English. Uh, you have, if you've been in any of our Tuesday night studies, you, you know that the... New Testament was written in Greek, but the first translation was in Latin. And so then from Latin, King James had it translated, and there was some things that were misinterpreted. This goes back. In the English language, we have three tenses. Present, past, and future. In the Greek, we have eight. So this is a more authentic translation to the original Greek that we do have some of them for sale. And if you're a studier of the Word, I suggest the Lavender's New Testament. You can talk to us after church. Luke 17, verse 11. And it came to pass, while he travels to Jerusalem, he was going through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. So on the way from wherever he was, Scripture doesn't tell us, but he's headed towards Jerusalem, and to get from where he is to where he's going, Jerusalem, he has to pass through Samaria and Galilee. I have context to that because I've been there. Four times. And when you see these things in your picture, picture these things in your mind, uh, it's not like going from here to California. It's more like going from here to St. Albans. So proximity is not as, as far as you think it is. They're walking, remember, everywhere they went. And so verse 12. He entered into a certain village. Ten leprous men met him who stood at a distance. Okay? Now watch this with me. Scott, you go over right here to this door. That's the gates of the city. He's going to be Jesus. I'm going to represent all ten lepers. I know I look big enough to be all ten of them, but I'm going to represent them. So he walks through the gates of the city. Stop. And as he walks through the gates of the city, here are ten leprous men. And notice that it says they stood at a distance. The reason that it says they stood at a distance is because Leviticus, the 14th chapter tells us that those who are lepers are seen as unclean. It even tells us how far they have to be from anyone who's clean. 500 steps. According to the Leviticus 14th chapter, now we talk a lot about types and shadows. Leprosy is a type and shadow of sin. Because leprosy caused the one who had le uh, uh, the disease to be outcast, to be at a distance, to be separated, to be looked over and left out. And before we found Christ and in our sins, we were separated, we were at a distance, we were socially outcast from the kingdom of God. But when we received the blood of the Lamb, we're no longer at a distance. You're going to see this here in just a second in this scripture, okay? So these ten leprous men met him at a distance. They're at a distance. Next verse. They lifted up their voices. Now, if. I'm over here, and I'm meeting Jesus. How you doing, man? Good to see you. I don't have to raise my voice. But if I'm meeting Him from a distance, I'm just trying to help you understand the Scripture. But if I'm meeting Him from a distance, I have to lift up my voice, and they cried out, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Now let me ask you something. How do they know who He is? Thank you, Scott. How do they know who He is? I believe that they've heard going throughout the villages, everywhere that they've encountered, because Jesus was going from village to village, and it says healing all who were afflicted and possessed. He was delivering and healing everywhere. So the word had gotten out, even over to Samaria and Galilee, not even Jewish communities, the word had gotten to the Gentiles that Jesus was in the healing business. And when they heard that He was coming through their town, according to the law, they had to be at a distance, but they cried out to Jesus. They didn't only recognize Jesus as a person because many in that day had been named Jesus. But they recognized Him as Master, Rabbi, Teacher. Have mercy on us. Can anybody say, Lord, have mercy on me? Verse, next verse. And having seen them, 
Jesus now said to them, after having gone, you must show yourself to the priest. Now Jesus was a man born under the law to teach those that were under the law how to get out from under the law. And what he's doing here is he's telling them, he's recognizing that they will do what the law has said to do in order to be healed. And the law said in Leviticus 14, you had to go show yourself to the priest. So now Jesus is telling them. Now they had to release faith to believe that if Jesus simply said, go show yourself to the priest, that they were going to be, whole, be made whole. Because if they didn't believe it, they wouldn't have done it. But see, see how that works? Uh, what, do you, what do we say? It doesn't take faith to not believe. It takes faith to believe. You don't have to have faith in a law. You have to have a faith in the person. They had faith in what Jesus said because they, if they didn't have faith in Jesus, they never would have started walking towards the priest. Because, here's, here's the reason I know that. They could have already walked towards the priest without Jesus telling them to go walk towards the priest. That was the law. And they knew that in order to be cleansed, that the priest was the only one that could say, you're whole and well. But it came to pass that as they responded in faith to what Jesus told them, the Bible says they were cleansed. How many of them? It says all of them. It says they were cleansed. Next verse. But one... Somebody say, but one. One of them turned back. He came back. He was healed and he turned, returned, glorifying God with a loud voice. That tells me that on his way, before he ever came in sight and range of where Jesus was at the time, he was already crying out with a loud voice. Now I want you to look at this next verse. And fell on his face at his feet. Now when he met Jesus, where was he? He was at a distance. But now that he's been made whole, now that he's been cleansed, where is he? He's at the feet of Jesus. That tells me that from the time he left by faith to go towards the priest and he got healed and he came back, his leprosy was gone or otherwise he would not have been within touching distance of the feet of Jesus. So something's happened <laughs> from the time he left Jesus' presence and he's healed and now he's coming back and he was a Samaritan. That's important to know. You'll see that here in just a minute. Next verse. Then having answered, I don't even know what question the man asked, but Jesus answered him. He answers with a question, were not ten cleansed, but the nine, where are they? Next verse. Where the, were they found, having turned back or returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? In other words, nine of you left, or ten of you left and only one came back? And he recognizes the one who came back in this scripture. It says he was a Samaritan and Jesus calls him a foreigner. The Bible tells us that Jesus came to his own and his own received him not. This scripture here tells me that nine were Jews. And one was a Samaritan, a Gentile. How do I know that? Because the nine that were sent away to go to the priest believed in the law. Because the law has said, go show yourself to the priest. They continued on their journey to go show the priest that they had been healed. But the one who was a foreigner had no use for the law because he wasn't even under the law. The law did not apply to him. So he goes to the man, Jesus, who's brought his healing. Isn't that something? Last verse. And he said to him, after having arisen, you must go your go. Your faith has healed you. I underline that word healed. We're going to come back to that at the end of the message. I want you to recognize that. From this story, I believe the Holy Spirit has given me three applications um, down to where the rubber meets the road that we can take this portion of Scripture that wasn't written to us, but it was written for us, and we can apply these uh, grace points to our life and we can begin to live out life with a thankful heart. See, we come before Him with a thankful heart. We worship Him and we serve Him from a thankful heart. So let's look at these together. The first one is recognize from where your blessings come. We have to begin to recognize your blessings don't come from Dow Chemical, Putnam County Parks, Walmart, 
Your, your blessings aren't, your, your pay doesn't come from him, uh, those places. Those are the pipelines through which Jesus is blessing you that in a monetary way. But when he blesses you through his Holy Spirit, all of that, James 1.17 says, every good and every perfect gift comes down from the Father above. Why does it separate good and perfect gift? Because everything that the Father gives to us is a good gift. I mean, he never. Uh, there is this teaching going around, and I just have to call it what it is. It's false teaching that says that God, God is the originator of putting His children through trials and battles in order to teach them a lesson. I say, nay, nay. Now He did say that there will be tri tribulations and trials in this world, but great, our faith is overcome. <laughs> Then we're more than conquerors. But here's this false teaching that says, my, my daughters are sitting back there. If I go up to my daughters and I'm going to say, I love you so much and I want to heal you, so I'm going to break your arm to show you how good I am. I mean, that's, that's the concept that we have when we're telling people that God is going to take you through. No. God does not do those things to you. Every good gift, and every perfect gift. There's a separation here. What's the perfect gift? Jesus. For God so loved that He gave. He gave us a gift. What's the perfect gift? Jesus is the perfect gift that's been given to us. And what do we teach our children? Or sh what should we be teaching our children? When you receive a gift, what do you say? We try to teach them. Say thank you. So when we realize that our Father who is good has given us every good gift, and every perfect gift, that one perfect gift, Jesus, and look at this scripture. It comes down from the Father of lights. That means He's a light. He is light. From whom is no variableness. That means He's not fickle. That doesn't mean that He's good to you when you're good and He's bad to you when you're bad. He doesn't change. Neither shadow of turning. He doesn't turn His back on you. That right there negates a doctrine that would say to you, God turns His back on sin. It's just the opposite. When there's sin, He comes to our rescue. We sang it this morning. He comes to our rescue every single time. Because of, and when we begin to recognize where, from where our blessings come, that will help us to have a thankful heart. We can be, become more thankful realizing that, yes, God uses men and women. God uses companies. God uses individuals and, and uh, different things and ways to bless us. But He's the blesser. He is the blesser. Even in Deuteronomy 8, it says that it's Him him who gives us power to get wealth. I think that's good stuff. Next point. Remind yourself of all of His benefits. Turn with me to Psalm 103, or you can look at the screen. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not... If you're forgetting not, you're reminding yourself. The best way to forget not is to remind yourself. Review. Remind yourself of all the benefits. Now the rest of Psalm 103 tells us those benefits. Look at the next verse. Who forgiveth on of thy, all of thine iniquities. The blood of Jesus doesn't just cleanse you of certain sins. It cleanses you of all your iniquities. The, now the blood of... Go Bo Bulls and goats, i got to slow down right here. My mind's going faster than my mouth can talk. I need to be on one of those commercials at the end that says, I can't even understand those people. He forgives us of all. The blood of goats and bulls could only forgive of certain sins at certain times when those sacrifices were made. And we have to get this mentality... And we work hard here at Grace Life to help you shift your thinking, to help you to understand that the blood of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is far greater than that of the blood of goat, bulls and goats. Because if it's not, then we limit the power of God to forgive certain sins. And unfortunately, we have a teaching that tells people, well, if you're a homosexual, that's an abomination, so that's worse. Or if you're a murderer, well, we got the big three, you know, homosexuality, adultery, and murder that we'll come down hard on. Uh, search, go through the internet and start searching. Seeing how many uh, sermons you find on gluttony, gossip, a lying tongue. 
Because all, all of those are listed in the things that He said you once were. It's not the things that you are now. You once were these things. And so the blood of Christ cleanses us, and that's one of the benefits that we need to remind ourselves of. We need to remind ourselves, let me show you something. Types and shadows again. When the blood of the Lamb was applied to the doorpost in Exodus 13, He said, once you've applied the blood, what did He say? Go inside. Inside, behind the blood, there's security. Outside, where there's no blood, there's no security. But if the blood has been applied, so can anybody say, I'm thankful for the blood of Jesus that's been applied, then there's security in that. In, in the blood, secure. Outside the blood, insecure. But, <laughs> that's, that's simple. You can teach a, a, a three-year-old, you stay inside the house with daddy and mommy, you're safe. You get outside of the house without daddy and mommy, you're not safe. How simple is that, that a child will not err therein, that if you can say, if you've had the blood applied to the doorpost of your heart, then you're secure, and when the death angel comes by, he will pass over. That's simple teaching right there. And that's a benefit that we can remind ourselves of. He's, he's saved us, He's cleansed us, and He's made us secure. It says next, go back one. There's two in that one verse. <laughs> Who healeth, of the common cold and some minor issues in your life. All of your diseases. Now I don't, you'll have to research this out. I've just heard this in passing and I haven't researched it, but I want to give it to you to go ahead and research too. I believe that the medical field would confirm to you that there are 39 different classifications of disease and sickness that you can list all other diseases under those 39. How many stripes did Jesus receive? 39 stripes. How many diseases did He heal us of? All. All of our diseases have been healed. The, they beat Him with a cat of nine tails and just shredded His back to pieces. He, and He took all of that in order for us to receive healing. And 1 Peter 2.24 says that by those stripes we are healed. Not that we might be, and we have to get beyond a mentality that Jesus has to perform a work when we ask Him for healing. The work has already been done. What we are asking for is, uh, we, we tell people, come and, uh, and let us pray for you for to be healing. We need to be giving altar calls that say, come and receive your healing. Dad and I were talking yesterday, almost every time that you look at Scripture, Jesus is not praying for blind eyes to be open. He says, oh, uh, eyes be opened. He doesn't pray for deaf ears to be unstopped. He says, deaf ears be unstopped. He doesn't pray, pray for the lame to walk. He says, get up and walk. So He's making divine declarations to people, providing healing to them, not praying a prayer for something to be done. So if my Master was do, using that as an example, then we shouldn't be praying and asking God to heal people. We should be declaring over people, you're whole. You're well. He already did the work. Come and receive the manifestation of your healing because that's a benefit that we need to remind ourselves of. Even when we have symptoms. Symptoms in our physical body. We're still whole. We're still healed. In Jesus' name. Who crowns my life. Next verse. Who redeemeth my life from destruction. That's deliverance. He's pulled us out of the pit. He's put our feet on the solid rock. He's, he has completely... 100% delivered us. The Bible doesn't say in our sins, it says from our sins. Who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies. When I think of crowns, I think of the head. You know, you see crowns, they go on the head. So what that means is, all of my thoughts are about His loving kindness and His tender mercy. Everything that I hear, whether it's of a bad report or if it's hatred, if it's negativity, it has to be filtered through loving kindness and tender mercies. My eyes are in the head region, so I'm looking out with loving kindness and tender He has crowned us with His loving kindness and tender mercies. Next verse. Who satisfies my mouth with pizza. Oh, no. <laughs> With good things. Somebody said filet mignon. Baked potato, butter, sour cream on the side, a little bit of ketchup. you got to have ketchup on everything, right? The rights do, anyway. Well, and thank God it, when I married Lisa, Jordan likes ketchup. Brand, we all like ketchup. We're, we have stock in Heinz. <laughs> yeah. 
but He satisfies your mouth with good things. So if He's satisfying us with good things, the praise that's in us, out of the heart flows, the, a thankful heart will produce praise. So that your youth is renewed like the eagle. So we recognize from where our blessings come, we remind ourselves of all of His benefits, and thirdly, we respond with an attitude of gratitude. Now these are just biblical applications. These aren't clauses that if you do these things, these things happen. We're doing these things because God has already done the work through Jesus Christ. So we, are, we recognize that our blessing comes from Him. We remind ourselves of all those benefits. And now because we recognize and remind them, we're responding with an attitude of gratitude. Look at verse 15, chapter 17 of Luke. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, returned and with a loud voice glorified God. He fell down at his feet, on, on his face at his feet, giving thanks, New King James says. He was a Samaritan. Verse 19, And he said to him, After having arisen, you must go. Your faith has healed you. I believe the King James there says, Made you whole. That word healed is translated there as the same word in Greek for salvation or saved. It's sozo, S-O-Z-O. And that, that word sozo means forgiven, delivered, set free, healed mind, soul, and body, and made complete. Now watch me. Michaela, if you'll come. Ten were cleansed. So ten, when they acted out of faith and did what Jesus said to do, go show yourselves to the priest, they were cleansed. All ten of them. We've established that the nine Jews continued on their journey. We have no record of what happened to those nine once they showed themselves to the priest and what the rest of their life was like. But I, I believe... My personal opinion is, if Jesus healed them and cleansed them of their leprosy, they'd never had leprosy again. That's, that's my own personal We don't have record of that, but I tend to believe that when Jesus does something, He doesn't do it halfway. He does it all the way. But we've got this one guy who's a foreigner. He's a Samaritan. He's a Gentile. And when he sees that he's cleansed, he returns to give thanks. Now, his returning to give thanks doesn't make him any more special than the nine other guys that were cleansed. But I want to show you what happens when we respond with an attitude of gratitude. It expedited something in his life. It sped up the process of something spontaneously and instantly that God did for him. His thankful heart, when he came, it says he was healed. Now in the scripture, in the Greek, in this, in this passage of scripture, ten were cleansed. That's the word that is used. They were cleansed. That means their leprosy was cured. But the one that returns is healed or made whole. Sozo. Instantly, out of his gratitude, he expedited a completeness in his life. Now I believe at some point in time, as time went on and those other nine learned who Jesus was in His fullness, I believe they were made complete as well. He doesn't leave anybody out. And I'm not trying to present to you uh, that you have to do something. All I'm telling you is out of a heart, because out of your heart is where the issues flow from. And when we respond in that gratitude, I believe, because, I mean, I don't know, but I think the Father smiles when we become grateful for what He's done for us. He's going to continue to do it anyway. Because He's good. But I think He just gets an extra little smile and He'll just come a little bit closer and He'll expedite some things in your life. Because you're grateful. Now over in Timothy, Paul's writing to Timothy and you have to understand the, law, the language and the culture and the context and the, the last days that he's talking to. Paul to Paul's talking to Timothy about is the transition of the old covenant fully passing away, the new covenant coming into full action with nothing else of the old covenant left. 
where Hebrews says there will re remaineth no more sacrifice. How's that? Because the temple was utterly destroyed and that old covenant system could not even come into play. But I believe that we have application for what I'm about to tell you here in today's society. Because Paul said that one of the signs of the end of times would be an unthankful generation. Can you just watch on a daily basis at Walmart and Kmart and grocery store or wherever we're at? People do not respond with thankfulness. I believe it's us, our, as parents, it's our job to teach our kids how to be thankful. We can also teach them in Sunday school, kids' church here. We can teach adults <laughs> how to be thankful. It's just, it's something that in this millennial age that we have a, a generation of kids that are just unthankful. Whether it's because they feel like they've been entitled or whatever the pro case may be, we're in a culture right now that outside of the church, they're not being taught to be thankful. Uh, so I think today as we can take these three points and many others, this is just simple teaching that we can ap apply these things and begin in our spirit to review and recognize where our blessings come from and remind ourselves of His benefit and then we respond. I'm thankful we come together on Sunday mornings and we respond with lifted hands, with praise from our lips. But we've got to respond. We ought to respond on a daily basis to the things that God has done for us. Spared us from car accidents, uh, put food on the table, put money in the bank. Even when the bank account's low, even though the bodies may be weak, we can still respond. Because 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says, In everything. The key word right here in this scripture is in. Not for. You don't praise God for the battle because it's not yours anyway, it's His. But in that battle, in it you're thankful because you know who brings the victory. In it you're thankful because He always causes you to triumph. In it you're thankful because He's never lost a battle. Yeah. But even in the blessings, when the bank account's flowing, all the kids are healthy, the car's not having any problems, the washer and dryer hasn't broke down and the refrigerator's full, we still, in everything, give thanks for this is the will of God concerning you in Christ Jesus. You want to know God's will? Don't be unthankful. Respond in a thankful heart with a thankful heart. Would you stand with me, please? If I could have all the band come back up. But as they come, would you sing that give thanks one more time? Give thanks to the Holy One. Give He's given Jesus Christ His Son Give thanks With a grateful heart Give thanks To the Holy One Give thanks Because He's given sing let the weak say let the poor say when we sing this verse and as the band joins in you joins in you can respond at your seat by kneeling by standing you could even come to the altar and kneel and stand but i want you to during this next few moments find something specific that he's done for you in your life and for you and respond to that as we sing
keep playing that song. And Let's just say that right now. Give thanks. Oh, give thanks with a great if you want to come and receive your healing, the manifestation of that healing, I believe the Holy Spirit laid on my heart to get some oil ready as a point of contact to anoint you this morning. So if there's anyone sick in your body, afflicted, have any symptoms going on, you would like to receive the manifestation of that healing. Would you come and let us declare your healing with you as you sing it again? With a grateful heart, give You stretch your hands and pray over these sisters right now. Declare they are whole, well, and healed in Jesus' name. Be well, be healed in the body. Every symptom be gone. In Jesus' name. May the power of God flow through your physical body right now with a healing touch. In Jesus' name. For the glory of God. Deaf ears open up, blind eyes begin to work. Diabetes, you have to go in Jesus' name. Kidney functions be restored to normalcy today in Jesus' name. Fibromyalgia, be healed. All pain, leave the body. We declare it in Jesus' name. Last time. Amen. We want to hear good reports when you you give thanks now because it's done. As those symptoms leave, we heard a good report from Brian and Kathy this morning. A miracle that. God did in their life. Mark Easton told me after the first service, he's been suffering with breath, his problems in his lungs. For several, He had cancer in the lungs. God healed him, but he's been suffering. He's not been able to sing and hold out notes or to talk for a very long time without getting shortness of breath. And last night at home in worship by himself, the Lord touched him. He was able to sing this morning, hold out notes, carry on a conversation without getting shortness of breath. We like to hear the miracle reports and give thanks to the Lord for what he's done. Amen. Yes, ma'am. What are you thankful for? For Gabby and, and uh, thankful for food and roof of our head. And amen. Amen. That's good. Thank you, Janet. We appreciate that. Okay, we'll sing that first song as everybody leaves this morning. Would you join hands with those around you and just pray a prayer with them or for them? If you need any special prayer or have anything on your heart, let us know. Be glad to pray with you and for you. Just whisper a prayer for your brothers and sisters right now. Jesus. Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name. Amen. May the Lord bless you. I know He has. And keep you. I know He's doing it. He's already caused His face to shine upon you, and He's been gracious to you. By God's grace, we'll see you Tuesday night. You are loved. You're highly favored. Deeply loved. In Jesus' name.